Hi everyone, this is Ryan Hoimi, and I'm the director of the Bon Vitell social media sites. And today we have a very special guest, Anita Shannon. Welcome, Anita. Hi there, Ryan. Yeah. So we're going to be talking a little bit about massage cupping, theracupping, metacupping, everything cupping then, right? You bet. Yeah. <laughs> and can you give us a little overview of how you got involved in the industry then? Oh, wow. Okay. That's a great story. <laughs> It's a good story. I worked in a Chinese acupuncture clinic as an assistant. So we had to do all the needle removal and do all the cupping therapy, gua sha, oh boy, everything. It was all according to doctor's orders though. And as I worked with these cups, um, it was very difficult in the beginning because we were doing fire cupping and it's a challenge to get good at that. But as I did this work, I noticed something really changing in the tissues, even with a brief three to five minute workout. So I kept asking the doctors in the clinic and they kind of looked at me like, you know, we're really interested more in Chinese medicine. So I asked them, they let me take the cups home. And as I worked through clients, uh, some of it was not as pleasant, but as I developed it, it got better and better. And we work this into a simple massage technique. And it's actually a series of techniques that make up this brand of body work. Um, that's the whole story. We just keep growing. Um, we've added educators. And as we add more people in, we get even more and more information. And our classes give us a lot of feedback. So you'll always see us writing articles, putting out new information, because the growth hasn't stopped yet. And you've also been a licensed cosmetologist since 1983, too. So what got you involved in cosmetology and stuff? Oh, that's an even fun, Well, not a real funny story on that <laughs> one. Um, I've had quite a few car accidents in my life, um, 10 to be exact. And um, I've been a passenger in eight out of those, unfortunately. And this one, I happened to be the driver. And uh, my brakes went, and I ended up in a really bad car accident with severe neck injuries. And I was 24 years old and told that I was done, that I was disabled for life, and that I was going to stay on medication. So I didn't believe that, and I found a massage therapist who did rather painful but necessary neuromuscular techniques and helped me get the use of my body back and to manage the pain. So I had had a job in retail, which didn't work after that. So I went to school for cosmetology so that I could sit and do facials. And it turned out to be the love of my life. And then you also, with cupping too, I know you um, add kind of a facial kind of treatment into it then, right? Definitely. Yeah. We can't ignore this. <laughs> There's so <laughs> muscles in here. <laughs> And especially with the huge amount of people like me, multiple car accidents, whiplashes, TMJ issues, um, everything from migraines, tension, headaches. I mean, this has to be addressed, you know, in massage also, but it's kind of nice to be able to do something for the face too, prepare people for surgery, help them avoid surgery, you know, all kinds of things. Yeah. And, and then what is some of the history with um, cupping, with, and especially with fire cupping? Boy, fire cupping has been around since the dawn of dirt. Um, basically, there's pictures of cups on the wall of the Temple of Amenhotep in Egypt. There is the Ebers Papyrus, the Yellow Emperor's Book of Medicine mentions it. And even in the um, Islamic tradition, when Muhammad was called up and educated, cupping was part of that education. So it's multicultural, it's Middle Eastern, Oriental, um, European, it's, it's got a very rich history. Each culture has a different name for it, but they all use the same tool, just do it a little differently. And it's a, um, I, I read somewhere that they actually use like wooden cups back in the day then too. Yeah, bamboo and wooden cups. Yeah. And and how that effective was it? How how effective was that? I mean, do you, have you heard anything or? <laughs> um, it, it's quite effective. I actually have tried the bamboo cups. It's just I, I can't see through them, so they are really more appropriate for the stationary work. And just a little problem with sanitation with wood and bamboo. And you know, you'd have to have a really nicely done wood one, or you could get splinters. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, definitely. And then some for liability insurance. Um, does fire cupping cover that then, or? Unfortunately, not. Um, we started out with fire cupping, and you will still see it on our DVD. Simply because if someone wants to try it, they need instruction. Because figuring it out on your, on your own is is really horrible, both for yourself and for the client. So we wanted people to still see how to do it, but it is not covered by liability insurance. And actually, from what I've heard, if you use it in a session, your insurance is null and void for the whole session. That anything else you do is not covered either. So it's too bad, but most of that started with people getting very short introductions and seeing it maybe for two hours in massage school, trying to figure out how to do it and getting the cup too hot. And then when they put the cup down on the person, they burned them. Oh. So yep. it's unfortunate. And and when have the cups, um, the, the ones with the vacuum and stuff like that, when have those um, come into play? When, when did those come around? Those have been around a long time. Basically, um, our physicians in this country carried cupping sets uh, well into the late, oh, say early 1920s. So they still used fire and the scarification or you know the bloodletting device, and they became very disenchanted with what they considered ancient ancient medicine. So the companies that produced the cups kind of panicked and figured out a newer approach, manual pistol. And the doctors still weren't convinced, so they came out with small machines. And one doctor used the machine for a woman that had lactation difficulties after delivering a baby. And they found that actually it expressed milk as well as eliminating the infection that she had. So, believe it or not, from cupping, that is where the breast pump was born. You serious? Pretty neat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really good to know and stuff, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, most people recognize it as something, you know, that they've used. It's not so foreign. Yep. And is there a certain um, tension and stuff when the, the suction, I mean, is it, um, are there some that have more of a tension? Oh, yeah, you can, with the vacuum sets with the pistol, you can keep pumping to create more and more suction. So that's the reason that's professional equipment. We do have a site called Air Cupping, which I'm sure we'll yak about later. But on that site, you'll see we don't offer that equipment. We offer safe, you know, equipment that only has a certain suction strength. Okay. I know uh, Dr. Oz was showing fire cupping for home use on his show, I think, um, last year and I was just amazed that he would tell people to do that at home with no experience. So we're hoping that people will get the message and use safer equipment at home. So when are you going to be on Dr. Oz? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I want to go on. <laughs> <laughs> like every once in a while I catch him and he's just showing, he was showing um, also to use a sink plunger around your knee for knee issues as a suction therapy. Well, you can just... Well, if you've got a torn, men yeah, you got a torn meniscus and you don't know it, and you're pumping around with that sink plunger, you're going to have quite a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I do, I think the popularity is really cool, especially, I mean, it was in the Karate Kid and all of that stuff, and I love the resurgence of interest, but I wish people... Um, would just be a little more discerning in the information they're passing out to the public. You know, there is a professional level of treatment, and then there's home care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so that's even a better reason to be on there then, too, so you can explain to them and educate them. And <laughs> yeah, we, we actually tried, but we just don't get any response. They keep saying, oh, we covered that already. It's like, um, no, you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess a drive-by cupping is in order. Yeah. <laughs> and was it last year that you had the pink cup project, right? Yes, we put that out on Pepsi for a vote. It all just happened so fast, and trying to get it out on Facebook, we had just started building Facebook, and we just weren't able to get the message out to everybody, you know, to please vote for the project. And it's so hard to get on there. I mean, it took me eight months just to get 
this submission accepted simply because there's 8 million people hitting the send button at the same time you are to get the application in for the next cycle. They give you like one minute every month. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Yep. And, and some people I've talked to, uh, even, even like 10 second window, you just got to get really minute. <laughs> Yeah, it yep. got really crazy. We were happy just to get on there. Um, and then I was just a real, we were very grateful for it. But we're still looking for funding for that. And we will keep looking at different, you know, places to see if the money can be supplied. And what is the Pink Cup project then for people that don't know about it? This is a project for breast cancer. We believe in prevention, of course. And then there are people who have been through surgeries, biopsies, mastectomies, partial, full, all kinds of different things, lymph node removal. Um, for those looking for prevention, we have a home care program. And the thrust of it is changing the environment of the birth breast. Um, vacuum work has shown that it can change the pH. So everybody knows that oxygenated, um, healthy pH of alkaline tissue is one of the best prohibitions against cancer formation. So we feel that there's restrictions from bras, there's restrictions from shoulder bags, from all the different strains around the shoulder and garments that we wear. That if women could just work in the shower for once a week, maybe twice a week, just for, for about three minutes, and open those channels back up, the drainage channels, that we could have a nice clear tissue in the breast and prevent you know the cancer from forming for those who have already had surgeries things like that we have a whole network of professionals that they can go and see because they need to start with a professional first and work as far as they can with them and then go home with the home care that they need to maintain and feel great yeah, and with with the uh, um, Pink Cup project too, um, you're trying to start to uh, um, start something else with that too, right? Um, actually, that's a, its own separate project. Um, we do a foster a firefighter project. We're looking at too, uh, since we stalled a little bit on funding for Pink Cup. The foster firefighter project would be a little easier, and we did get a good start on a wonderful firefighter that we met at the Florida Chiropractic Show. And he was one of the firefighters at the 9-11 crisis and lost his partner and told us the state of the professionals who were involved in that. And, of course, you all have probably seen the you know, television special that shows the, the horrible lung damage that was done. So we feel we've been able to pull smoke up to the skin surface in so many people. It's just a byproduct of vacuuming the back. It starts pulling that debris from the lung tissue and from behind it and everywhere else that got lodged. So we did one treatment on this fellow and very dramatic change for him. Um, he could breathe better. Um, we also do work to open up the diaphragm, things like that. But the next day he came back to see us and his skin even had turned a little pink instead of the gray color that it was. So if we can do this and start in New York and do this across the country where people could adopt a firefighter and once, twice a month, just a few minutes of vacuum work over the back and whatever else they need in that area to eliminate the smoke buildup for them and help preserve their lungs. So when people have a lot of bad things in their body, when it's trying to get out, so the skin just turns a little bit different cover, color when the cupping is then? Yeah, and the history is still in there. We pull old cigarette smoke out of people who have never smoked a cigarette. It's secondhand smoke from childhood. Um, people have turned some pretty crazy colors on our table. One woman, her skin turned very chalky, dusty gray, and it turned out that it actually was coal dust that her father, when she was a little girl, was a coal miner. And all of that was still in there. So it's, it's fascinating. Can you imagine a firefighter, how much buildup of smoke there is in his lungs or her lungs? Yeah, all oh, big time. And even though they have their masks and everything, but it's got to be able to get in. I mean, it's getting into their body one way or another. So Definitely. Yeah. Um, and if you do watch the videos of 9-11, when the crisis really hit, a lot of firefighters 
ran out without masks. And you see them in shock themselves, kind of walking around. And you know the exposure for them and the people who are running around is huge. Just all those chemicals all at once, too, and stuff. And it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So those are two of the projects. The third one we're looking at is, not looking at, but making our plans for is the Massage Cupping or Vacuum Therapies Institute. So this is a way for us to start doing some studies, getting some data together. Because the medical field, we work very closely with them already. Um, they're very, very interested in having some clinical data besides before and afters and case studies to present. So that's fun because we teach in a lot of hospitals now, and that's exciting. Yeah, and it's my understanding that you just got back from France too. So <laughs> yes, yeah. the mirror I. Um, this year, I didn't have any physicians in the class. I had some physiotherapists from over there, though, and people who work in the hospitals. Uh, the structure is very different over there, but we have trained some pediatricians over there, um, one general practitioner, one naturopathic physician. So we actually have a trainer in France now and a second one possibly coming on at one of the massage schools. Oh. Yay. Yeah, and and with um, do they really know much about cupping over there? Then is it as um, popular and known compared to here? It's getting there. People are starting to ask a lot of questions. It's kind of growing the same way as it did over here. Except the nice thing over there is they're already used to the tool. It's familiar to them. Um, they've had them in their medicine cabinets, but most of the time, even in traditional folk cupping, it's been in stationary cups. And so when they come and learn the techniques that we've put together that are all moving and active, it's a new surprise. That's the reason we're, we're going to finally consider getting a providership in the traditional Chinese medical group. We never felt it was appropriate because we do body work and massage, but now we found that the practitioners in TCM want to add this in, so we're going to do it. And is it hard for um, the traditional TCM um, practitioners to go to this form of cupping when they're basically taught fire cupping and everything else? Well, they're taught how to create a vacuum and they're taught stationary work based on traditional Chinese medical diagnosis and treatment. Most of that work is stationary where the cups sit and there's a reason for that. Um, they do do something called moving cups, and that is mostly just to raise what they call sha to the skin, very much like gua sha. So it's a way of eliminating heat, which is a lot of what we do too. But I think when they see the fascial work, the scar work, the lymphatic work, um, the repair work, the cleaning work, everything that we do with this that goes will fell on top of what they already do. They get pretty excited. It's really fun. There was a lot of misunderstanding in the beginning. They thought I was teaching traditional cupping to people. And we definitely are not. We don't talk anything about Chinese medicine because I respect it too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it takes a lifetime to understand it and to learn it too. So it's just like, I mean, even though yeah. I've been, been around for thousands of years, it's just even practitioners have been in the field forever keep saying they're keep learning all the time you know yeah. you bet yeah. you bet I just I respect it immensely I use Chinese medicine I go to practitioners for my own my own health issues so um, to me it's it's just such a significant medical model that people really need to understand it's quite complex and I've also seen some acupuncturists um, put a needle down um, on the body and then put a cup over the top and even makshi um, on it too and stuff like that. So, um, have you seen those before? And... Yeah, we did a little of that um, in the clinic. Most of the time, their needling and their cupping sec sections were separate, but every once in a while, I did see them do that technique. It was a special stimulation for the needle, and the moxibustion is even more stimulating. You know, again, bringing heat to the surface, adding heat to the point. It's pretty much um, what they use for a severely blocked point. And a question in the chat, um, will it be helpful for older scar tissue and will it soften areas around it? Oh, yes. I don't care how old a scar is. 
We work on 40, 50 year old C-section scars to free up the drainage in the belly area for people. And it's, it's immediate. You know, we've had people walk back out of the bathroom with their pants held out a few inches from their waist. Um, it doesn't matter how old the scar is. We can work on it and get it to the best it can be. And is it possible to perform it on keloids at all? Yes. Yes, you have to be very careful with keloid. If you overstimulate it, it will start producing more tissue, of course. So if you work gently around the perimeter first and just start smoothing it out gently. For some reason, everyone thinks they have to go in on the scars, you know, with like a jackhammer. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I tend to work very gently over these things. I found that less is better, kind of like aromatherapy. The less I do, and especially with keloid, the better. But you can smooth them and help them get much more pliable for people and increase range of motion if it's restricting a limb. Um, we've been able to help people with very old injuries that never thought they were going to be able to lift their arm again. And then a couple other questions. Um, this one, what about help with dead nerves? Oh, dead nerves. We do a lot of work with the magnets with that, those little micro cup magnets. That and MS, which is not dead nerves, it's, you know, the lesions. We've had some success, you know, and not everyone responds to everything. So we have had some success stories and then some people that it just, you know, did not help them as much as we had hoped. But diabetic neuropathy, we've done extremely well with that. So I'm very happy if I can get someone to feel their feet again. And another question, um, exactly how long would you say to work on a scar? Wow. Each one is significant. Um, it depends on how old it is. The older the more it can tolerate. If it's a very new, new scar, you're going to have to do extremely minimal work, like maybe one pass with the cup, even on a, a pumping movement. It feels like you're not doing much, but uh, you will see results from it. It's the hardest thing therapists have to face is that this is working smarter, not harder, and you don't have to go in so deeply on people. And what about... So, oh, okay, go ahead, sorry. Uh, Good example, I, sorry to interrupt you, yep. but it just flashed into my head. A real good example is burns. Um, I've had the pleasure of working on some people who were burned severely in childhood um, over a large percentage of their body, which means you know multiple surgeries through their life, just a lot of agony. And we had to go in with such a light pumping movement over their burned tissue, even you know 60 years later, it, people thought I was nuts that I just did this very, very minute pump, did one pass on the person, then asked him to stand up, and we gained four degrees in forward movement. And then another question, how soon after surgery would you recommend starting treatment, like for joint replacements? As soon as the doctor gives you the okay. <laughs> be honest with you, it's a big rule um, for us that if you're going to work on that kind of a patient or a client, you need to be collaborating with the physician and let them know what you're going to be doing. If that's not possible at all, to so even network with the nurses or somehow get, you know, that it's okay for them to get this work or massage work, um, usually it's about eight weeks. Um, with doctor's permission, we've gone in as soon as three weeks on certain surgeries, but we had a written permis permission from the doctor. And have things changed over the years, too? I remember back in the 90s when I went to massage school, I mean, they said for people with cancer, you got to wait forever kind of thing and get permission, all these kind of things. But and that's got kind of lightened over the time. But has anything changed over the years with cupping at all? Um, people are becoming more and more aware of it. Actually, physicians are becoming so aware of it that they are starting to write prescriptions for it which is really amazing. It still is termed a manual therapy. Um, that's the ICD-9 code and the, the insurance codes that we use. And it's the networking has gotten a lot stronger with what we're doing. Um, we do use the term vacuum therapies quite a bit with the physicians, just so they don't get the wrong idea that it's cupping, you know, the traditional cupping again. Because that they just don't understand very much. Yeah. <laughs> And another question, um, I have a client that has a gastric bypass surgery and loves the cups gliding over a loose skin. Is this all right? 
Yes, we work a lot with gastric bypass and, and bariatric surgeries. It's some of the best things you can do for them, get that lymph going and get rid of what we call solid bloat. Then they see this big change very quickly in their body and it just really assists them in moving forward and also raises their metabolic level. Once you clear out that solid bloat and debris, now the fat can start being used and burned efficiently and the cells can eliminate waste. And is there a big difference between the theracuppings and the metacupping and the regular cupping and stuff for, for treatment yeah. wise? Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, treatment wise, not as much, but in equipment, yes, that's where we've differentiated. Um, med cupping is using the machine and the reason it's very different is the machine will do a lot of the pumping for you. So it's very consistent. You can do a very light lymphatic, superficial lymphatic pumping or you can go deeper with it. Um, the machine can be used for, in many different ways. We also have a bifurcated hose so we can do a lot of traction work, things that we couldn't do easily with the manual sets. But the manual sets, I still pull mine out, you know, for things. And massage cupping is really using the manual equipment. Um, theracupping is only for home use, and we have restricted the dangerous equipment that people can get. But I did see on the doctors that they demonstrated a vacuum machine for home use. And the doctor was so funny. He never, the woman was on the table, he really never even demonstrated it. Because I don't think he knew how to use it, but he sure talked a lot and every once in a while, you know, sucked on her upper arm or something <laughs> and then gave it to her, you know, and walked away the hero of the show. And it was like, you just handed this woman a loaded weapon. <laughs> 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 Poor thing does not use it even. So it's, um, it'll be interesting to see. I think a lot of people are going to try and cash in on it and I just hope that it doesn't lead to injuries at home. Public safety is number one in this. <laughs> and another question, what's the difference between metacupping class and level one massage cupping class? In the metacupping you are working with the machines and not the manual equipment. So I get to go more into client intake, I get to go more into the magnet work and I get to go more into the lymphatic system than I get to in massage cupping level one. Because in massage cupping, I'm trying to get you used to so many different pieces of equipment. So we recommend that people start with massage cupping to get to know the manual equipment and the basics. Um, and then do meta cupping. But a lot of people really are working in hospitals and facilities where they can't use the manual. So they've asked just to come directly into meta cupping and they do very well. We just did a class this weekend here at the training center in Asheville. And I had three people who had taken massage cupping and three people who had taken nothing. And all of them did extremely well and liked the information, got new information, and had a really great experience. The biggest feedback I got was that it did overlap slightly with the massage cupping, and a lot of them found they had forgotten a lot of things. So they liked the review. <laughs> so I'm pretty excited about that, that you can come into massage cupping or metacupping level one and then go into level two. Another question is, um, is your company accepting or looking for more educators? Is you, um... Oh, not at this time. We've got, that, wow, eight of us here in the States and then in Europe. There's a couple of people asking in Canada and I need to get back to them and talk to them because um, we would like to be in Canada also. Instead of us having to travel, it'd be easier if someone was just up there. And then we do have a, someone that wants to open, open a training center in Greece. So we will have our class next year in France, but we're also possibly looking at having another workshop in Greece. Woo-hoo! Yeah. <laughs> the world tour. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so right now we're not accepting new educators. Um, but if you're interested, you know, people can always contact us and, and we can always talk and see. You never know if one of our educators might be having a life change and making plans to head to China like one of them did. You know, things change quickly for people. 
And I remember quite a few years ago, um, Gwyneth Paltrow, do you remember she had a whole bunch of cupping bruises on her body and stuff? Um, is bruising um, common with your form of cupping then? or? Actually, it's not bruising. We call them cup kisses or discolorations, decorations, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> Connect the um, dots. Or... <laughs> no, but I like doohickeys. Yeah, yeah. Doohickeys is a good one. Um, actually, this is blood that's in the tissue. So if you get a discoloration like that, um, you have some old blood stuck in that tissue, and it's a good possibility it's probably gluing the fascia down also. So this is one thing that we really never thought about in massage or body work, and I think the whole love affair for me began in that Chinese clinic when I walked into one of the treatment rooms and the acupuncturist had lanced a woman's neck, you know, right through here, dowager's hump kind of thing, and had put a cup on it. And as I walked in to clean up the mess, here was the cup still on, still in vacuum, and it was full of this black, thick material, and it was actually old blood. And that's when I finally got the idea of congestion in our tissues that we had no one had ever talked about. So here we're get, getting trying to get fascial glides, do all this stuff, and we've got old blood in there just sticking everything together. So the discolorations, while not um, really nice looking, uh, do eliminate a lot of that, and it really doesn't come up too much in my work because I've gotten used to moving the cup off when I see the color coming up. I'd rather it just got pulled out of the tissue and left to float a little more freely for the lymph to carry it away. But I can erase one usually a day or two later by using a cup over it to wash the underside of the skin. And it's it's neat. You can't dissipate a bruise like that. But I can make a cup kiss usually go away in a day or so. Okay, so that's pretty normal for a day or two then? Uh, some people, they last longer. And it depends on how aggressive the therapist was that worked on you. That's why we keep asking people to lighten up. Um, I had one whole class of neuromuscular therapists, and I kept asking them the first day to, you know, think about maybe backing off a little bit. Um, they all crawled in on their hands and knees the next day, and they got it. They got the message that, you know, this is a very strong therapy, and back off on it. <laughs> and Sorry, I just get such a kick out of the students. I, I learned so much from them, but... And then there's this whole debate, especially on Facebook, I've seen it a lot about toxins, about lactic acid and stuff like that. And um, what's your beliefs about behind those things? Well, what's, which I've seen quite a few too. Which uh, claims or which uh, were you asking about? Oh, well, the lactic acid that it doesn't, uh, massage doesn't actually do anything with lactic acid and stuff. And the, they call it the lactic acid myth and stuff. And um, I still believe that is why we did petrissage. I mean, that was part of the original development um, of Swedish massage, upon which all massage is truly based. No matter what you think, it's still based on that original. Petrissage was to milk the muscle. Um, I do how the body elimin How does the body eliminate lactic acid naturally? Urinating and right. Yeah. Well. How does it get from the muscles into the urine? It has to be worked. <laughs> right. It means activity. If we are inactive, lactic acid builds up in our muscles. Massage is a passive form of exercise. But if it is, if there is not a milking motion, as in petrissage, I kind of agree. You probably are not moving the lactic acid. I know um, definitely we are moving it with the vacuum therapy. Uh, we can even move very old crystallized lactic acid out of joints and things, and it, it feels like sand. But I think you just have to either do a petrissage or a vacuum work that normal effleurage um, or neuromuscular techniques or active isolated stretching, all these great things, they're just not going to address it as much. But I still think any movement like active isolated stretching is going to facilitate some drainage, don't you? Yep. And, okay. Yep, and then um, another one's, another question, is there uh, recent research supporting the theory behind cupping at all? Aha, 
there's a lot of research out on traditional cupping therapies. Um, this is part of the reason we want to get the Institute together is we'd like to get some clinical data out there that is current. Um, I do know that there are studies that L.K. Chirali refers to um, in his book um, about shifting the pH, that this has been proven to shift the pH. I'm still trying to find those studies myself, too. And I, there's a lot out there that can cross over into what we do. But we'd like to actually you know, start doing some current clinical data ourselves, too. And is there a difference for time frame for, let's say, a geriatric person or somebody middle-aged or a younger person and stuff, how long you should have to keep the cups on them then? Or? Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Um, my husband actually works on a wide range of people, and he's a medical massage therapist. He works on people that are 94 years old down to, I think the youngest one he worked on was eight. So... Um, Go gently on elderly people and young children, and of course, use smaller cups. But to be honest, especially for the elderly and the geriatric, this is just a huge gift because you're creating space, you're stimulating, I mean, really stimulating circulation, getting the fluids moving, getting the lymph moving, good passive exercise for the muscle, especially with the pumping movements that we do with the machine. So I find the machine is better for children, infants, and elderly, simply because we can control the suction so well and not make a mistake by pumping too hard on the gun or on a rubber bulb. But I don't care what age you give me. Um, you know, if we could get this on animals, we'd be vacuuming animals too. <laughs> <laughs> and and is, um, cupping, is that kind of similar to um, myofascial release, would you say? It will do myofascial release, definitely. The neat thing is it's such a malleable tool and such malleable techniques that you can do anything from lymphatic drainage to myofascial release. Um, the thing that I say to students in class that is the most exciting to me is I've given you the movements, the theory, the foundation. Now take this with your foundation of knowledge and translate it. If you've studied with James Waslowski, if you've studied with Bruce Baltz, if you've studied with Aaron Mattis, you know, all these different people, um, Eric Dalton, take what you learned from them and translate it into using it with the cup. Instead of doing a psoas release with your hand, put a cup there. Start using this and integrating it into the work you already know. It's not separate. So it does whatever you want, which is really, really fun. And then somebody asked, um, what machine would you recommend? Oh, there's some really good ones out there. It depends on how much you want to spend. Um, we started out with two absolutely stunning machines that we loved, but they were six and ten thousand dollars, and nobody could afford it except the big spas. And it just killed me to see the technique suffering or the techniques suffering because no one could afford the equipment. So we found an inexpensive machine for people to get going with. Um, it's about four hundred dollars, probably going up to about four twenty-five or so in the next month. But it allows you to get started and really hone your skills. I still have my same machine after four years, and it's still working great. Um, and I'll probably just get another one. But the other models that are out there, I mean, even iSculpt has one. Um, I know that uh, Liposage has one. I just can't, don't really care for the ones that have the rollers along with the long rollers on either side along with the vacuum because I find that it pinches the skin and I'm, I'm just not real fond of that. I really think the pure vacuum is the better way to go for everybody. And then another question, what cups are your favorite? Um, which ones do you use more, most often? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the most often I have to say I use the Russian silicones because I keep them in the shower. So if I'm feeling a little bloat coming on because I do have some gastrointestinal stuff and I tend to blow up every once in a while, I can just use the cups in the shower with soap and water and they're real easy and real fun and just do about five, 10 minutes and within the ne by the next day, everything has eliminated and the bloat has started going away. It's really nice. I actually did a little facelifting and drainage before we did the interview. 
<laughs> and last year, um, Angie Patrick uh, on my show, what she she did, she said she put perfume on beforehand. So. <laughs> Here. Yeah. Uh, it's, good, it's good to see her. Yeah. The <laughs> and yeah. Is, is there any major contraindications or things that you should ask more permissions with? Um, different kind of diseases or. Yeah, the contraindications are the same for this as for any type of massage. So if you've got somebody with diabetes on your table or someone on blood thinners, you're going to keep your suction strength really low. Um, just as you would not go in really deeply on them in massage. Um, of course, elderly people and children we talked about, just start gently. Um, other than that, it's again gliding movements over um, what they call endangerment sites or blood vessels. One thing I'm really noticing a lot is that people seem to have forgotten a little bit about centripetal movement. And I think in massage, we've kind of slipped a little bit on that. But with the vacuum therapy, it is imperative that you at least finish the limb with centripetal movement and learn to clear proximal before distal. Um, if you've got a swollen ankle and you try and push that up a leg you haven't already cleared, you're going to create a problem right around the knee, probably for most people. So a few simple you know, basics that people need to remember. And... Just a, a little more foundation in lymphatics. Um, it seems to be something we're lacking in education, and I'm not sure why people are not getting a good grasp of how important the lymphatic system is. But contraindication-wise, other than just putting the magnets near somebody with a pacemaker or an insulin pump, pump you know, silly things like that that we do have to remind people about, um, it's the same as for massage. And I see you have some different sizes of cups. I mean, is that for specific areas of the body and stuff? Or You bet. Yeah. You bet. The machine comes with these extra really large cone-shaped cups. And we love those, um, especially for big athletes. You're working on you know, a football player or a hockey player. You know, some of these athletes are really massive guys and girls. And so we need these big cups to you know, work on some of those muscles. But the fun thing that the athletes have loved with the work we're doing is the gluteal work. So we'll take one of these huge cone-shaped cups and park it on their glutes and then just start pumping. And it just lifts that huge muscle group up in a way that you just can't do with massage. And then we go down the IT band and TFL and all of that and separate all of that that's gotten you know, rock hard and fused from overactivity. And the accolades, I mean, some of the teams are actually flying people around just to do this for them. Um, one of our educators, Stacy Nevelis, gets flown around, I think, by the Patriots and a couple of the Red Sox. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, catching on, but the biggest cups are really a big favorite for me because of the gluteal work and the work we can do post-mastectomy um, with those large cups and lift those mastectomy scars off of the rib cage with you know, no pain and no um, no problems for the person on the table. They've been through enough. Another question. Um, I'm asking about your beliefs about making sure that the therapist uses bilateral movements. Example, the paraspinals. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you. you know, the, if you're, the work should be done bilaterally. And you know? why is that then? Well, with the cups, you mean? Yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, you can leave somebody severely out of balance. <laughs> Are you just working on the one side? Um, is that what you're asking about? Um, the person asks, I'm wondering about the beliefs about making sure that the therapist uses bilateral movements. So they're asking why you want to use the bilateral movements then. Unlike okay, it, yeah. I want to make sure I'm answering their question yeah. correctly. <laughs> um, again, if you were to work along the spine and not work bilaterally, you could with this therapy you could leave somebody pretty um, pretty out of whack. We tend to use this to balance people out. Um, I do cross over the spine with it too. Um, it really loosens a lot of the small intervertebrals and a lot of the fascia in there. 
So I hope I'm answering what they're asking about. I'm a little unclear as to exactly what I, what they're asking. The person said yes, so yeah. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, even the face. I mean, the funniest thing we do to people or a torture person here is we drain half of the face, and they end up with this one side all lifted up, and on the other side still drooping. Um, but again, if you're working with somebody who had Bell's palsy or facial paralysis, trigeminal issues, you might want to work just on that one side for a while and, and integrate bilaterally, um, maybe two or three treatments in. Does that make sense? Yep. And another okay. question, um, can you use essential oils with the cups? Best thing is to use them afterwards because you've created all this wonderful dilation at the surface. So my suggestion is put the essential oils on, cover it with a towel, something thick, and when I leave it covered for about 10 to 15 minutes, and boy, the penetration is amazing. Liniments, essential oils, any product, it's best to use after you finish the work and you have a nice pink tissue in front of you. And then um, with the cups, like with the TheraCups, do you have instructions how to use those then? Yeah, we're, we're putting, we filmed the DVD and we're putting it together um, probably over the next six months if I can get off airplanes. Yeah, <laughs> you're constantly traveling all the time. So. <laughs> I know, I just have to learn one word, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't because people are so excited um, and they want to see this so much that I, I just, you know, I have a hard time saying no. Um, yeah, it does put me in the air quite a bit, though. I joke to everybody that I live in an airplane and visit Asheville. So. <laughs> <laughs> and another question, is it all right to go up and down over the spine? Yes, unless they have really bony prominences, then that could be a little uncomfortable. If that's the case, then suction and release or pumping movements down the spine. But nothing feels better. It feels um, it's a replacement, and I think, uh, Ryan, you actually, did another video that mentioned this with um, the author of that book on tools where she said this is just like skin rolling so I don't do any skin rolling anymore I take it right from you know, the occiput if possible and I just go all the way down but just make sure you're really lifting up on the cup and really getting a good pull on it not where it keeps popping off them but you know something where you're really stretching the tissue for them then you're also a Bombatel educator too. So, what kind of products do you recommend to? <laughs> I love Bombatel. Love it. Um, one student surprised the heck out of me. I tried so many gels with this, and nothing ever worked. And a student came in, and he had the Bombatel massage gel. And of course, you know my favorite, the organic. And um, I said, well, I don't know, you know, but give it a try. You know, this is what you're here for as a lab, and let's see how it works. And he said, well, I think you should try it. And I reluctantly agreed and said, okay, well, I've tried a lot of gels, but I'll do it. It is the best ever. So I love the gel, the massage gel, and I love the lotion, and I love the cream. So I use all three because people's tissue is so different. Um, I'm a big fan, of course, just of the organic and natural lines because I'm a tree hugger from Asheville. Because <laughs> um, we, we are part of one concept and we do run a, a very green business here. But, um, oh, what's really nice is Palm Vital came out with fractionated coconut, which is my favorite, favorite, favorite of all time. I love fractionated coconut oil. Well, that's nice to know. <laughs> and then there's three other questions in the chat. Uh, the chat's is lighting up. <laughs> it, it, um, what about cellulite treatments? Ah, well, we talk a lot about solid bloat because it's kind of encompassing cellulite. It works extremely well to smooth out the tissue. Um, has great health benefits too. Solid bloat is just old lymph and debris in there, and it's just re-triggering a lot of things at a cellular level. So it's kind of like clearing out a, you know, a polluted city. Once we clear off all of that old cellulite, all the old lymph, solid bloat to me was a term that just said it all. Cause it feels solid, but it really is just this bloat we've got. 
So we can move it, we can make change in people, and it's change that stays. So it's not an event, it's a series of treatments, um, about eight treatments, but you will probably average out between eight and 12 inches of change. And hopefully you'll see that person five years later and they're going to look the same. Because we, we move 20, 30 years of accumulation. So it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, it, it works for me too. I mean, I get bloated up just from sitting in the airplanes and in front of the computer and it's really helped me keep that under control and keep my lymph going. Yep. And here's another question. Um, when pulling smoke out of the lungs, does it come out uh, from the skin? No, it comes up under the skin. And if it turns a gray color, it's uh, the person, it was second hand or it was a campfire or, you know, how people are around so much smoke that they don't even realize. <clears throat> if it's a grayish yellow color under the skin, there's nicotine in there. Usually they were the smoker themselves. Um, it stays under the skin. We don't pull things out through the skin, but sometimes you can get a little smell of it or a whiff. Um, that and anesthesia, when I work on the diaphragm with people, sometimes over the liver, um, we'll get this little whiff of gas that will come through the skin, and it's, it's definitely some kind of anesthesia or something. <laughs> Ooh, it's intense. But no, we aren't actually pulling it through the skin. Sometimes people have reported, though, when they worked over an area for a long amount of time, that the oil on, um, or the cream or lotion, whatever the product was on the back, did start turning a brown color. So that was interesting. And then here's another one. Uh, will it help um, hiding the dimplings, or um, will it um, help with scar or, um, wrinkles, too? Yeah. Yeah, I keep them. Um trying to help my wrinkles with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what you're doing with the wrinkles is with the stimulation, you are stimulating collagen and elastin production that may have slowed down because of age or environmental factors. You're also clearing the lymph out, which is keeping a healthier cell. When the lymph all backs up, it's like a city that doesn't have garbage pickup. It gets polluted and it gets stinky and the cells or houses start to suffer because they can't eliminate their waste. So they become unhealthy homes. Same thing with the cells. If there is a backup of old lymph and solid bloat, the cells can't stay very healthy. So if you drain the face and or other places where there are wrinkles, you know, loose skin, the arms, things like that, um, you can actually help tighten the skin. We do this for people who have had large weight loss issues too. So we help tighten their skin up, prepare them if they need the surgery, or just help them get it to the best it will be. And then you're also writing a book then too, right? Back to you therapies? Yeah, I know, and it just keeps getting longer. <laughs> I, mean, I just keep learning more and more, keep adding it in. A suggestion has been made, and I think I'm actually going to follow it, where I'm just going to start publishing it section by section instead of in full. Okay. Sound good? Yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yeah, and and then are you yeah. going to make more DVDs soon too then, or...? Yes, level two is going to come out on a DVD um, because it is so much about um, assessment. Um, and then you, you gave me that link today to the you know powwow, and that would be fun then to finish the education from the level two DVD with a small group like that online, going through case studies, really showing them how to develop the protocols, why, how long, you know, and then taking on, you know, existing clients, um, you know, actually going over their cases. So that will be the next one, that and Therica coming out. And then we'll be, we will be doing a short series on different body sections. And you can already see that uh, on some of the YouTube videos, but we will be offering classes and online classes that just address, you know, the back or just address the neck and head, the shoulder, the arm, and start really breaking it down for people who have specific interests too. And then a couple other questions too. Um, um, if it doesn't come um, out through the skin, would you flush it out through the lymph, the urine? Yes, the lymph does eliminate through kidneys, urine, bladder, all of that. So, but always remember when you're doing the vacuum work that all roads lead to the nodes. I know that somebody else is cute saying, 
I don't know who, but I heard it and I think it's marvelous is when you're looking at doing this kind of drainage or directing debris, you must know the lymphatic um, node locations and guide that debris towards it to be filtered. And that's when from there it goes through its system and into the kidneys. <clears throat> and another question, um, how much do you recommend to charge for treatments and how many times do you recommend they visit? Asking for a protocol. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how many times to recommend. I mean, if it's a full shoulder replacement, it's going to be about 18 treatments. If it's a melanoma scar, it's probably going to be nine. So each person is very different. Um, someone with advanced diabetes would take much longer than somebody, you know, newly diagnosed. So that one I can't really answer. Charging wise, what we recommend though is that you do a 20 to 25 percent upcharge on your base price. So if you are charging 60 for a massage, I would add 20. Um, that's 25 percent. Uh, no, wait. Did I just get a percentage wrong there? <laughs> <laughs> I think I did. Yeah. You know, if it's 80, you might be doing 25% um, of that is 20. Yeah. Then you might be charging 100. So 60 would be 75. Boy, my math just suffered there, didn't it? <laughs> so uh, that's my recommendation. Um, the first time I work on somebody, I don't upcharge them. I want to make sure it works well for them. The next time they come in, they understand it's an upcharge. And to be honest with you, they always ask for it because they got such great results the first time. No one has minded paying an extra 25% to have a frozen shoulder released in two sessions. Uh, it's quick. It's really quick. And then where can we see you in person this year? Ooh. Well, we will be having fun with Bon Vital at the IECSC in about two weeks. Um, that's going to be in Las Vegas, the IECSC, which is International Aesthetics, Cosmetics, and Spa Conference. And you'll be seeing us, of course, at World Massage Festival. And there we're going to be doing a full workshop, a two-day workshop. And I think it might be full. I'm not sure, but I think it's already booked full. Um, we also will be doing, of course, the uh, – I can only do one day at the Canadian Massage Conference because my husband's son is getting married that weekend, which we're excited. And we will be doing the Hickory Spa Salon uh, Conference, and that's in November. And my gosh, oh, we've got FSMTA in July. We've got the Florida Chiropractic Show in August. So, yeah, we, we keep hopping around to every show. We're getting more and more active in the chiropractic field now, too. And uh, uh, chiropractors, have they um, grasped on to cupping more, have you seen over the years? or? <laughs> yeah. The response was hysterical. We did our first show one or two years ago, and... They all walked up to us looking at us like, you guys look like freaks. You know, what are you doing? Because it, it is, it's a very strange thing when you first see it. It just doesn't look right. And they were so curious. And so we asked a few of them to get on the table. And they were like, oh, no, no, no. We, we don't take our shirts off and, you know, kind of thing. And one guy, I finally got him to get on the table. And he got on, he felt it. He stood up and he looked at all of them and he said, OMG, that was amazing. And at that point, shirts started flying, trousers started flying. These guys all. <laughs> so when they got on the table and felt it, they really got what this could do for their clients and to really enable their spinal adjustments to stay in place instead of getting pulled out by memory, tissue memory. And then one last question. So old cellular debris can be hanging out for, um, out in the tissues for decades then? Yes, definitely. Um, we didn't know that. I got 18 nose here today. Yeah. Um, we didn't know that until um, we started pulling all these weird colors up in people and trying to find out what they were. You know, if you've got somebody 40 years old on the table who's had chronic bronchitis and you keep pulling all this gray out of her, you know, into her skin, in her back, it's pretty obvious since she was around, you know, smoking parents until, you know, 10 or 12, that this is 30, you know, some years old sitting in there. So it's, I learned something. I keep learning from the cubs. I learned that 
our history is still in there. A lot of the drugs, a lot of things that happened to us as kids, DDT. One of the biggest ones was a student who came in and never thought that the fact that she was in Europe and exposed to the Chernobyl incident um, in the 80s, that this had had a bearing on her health issue. And she was, you know, large because, and bloated and could never figure out why she couldn't lose the weight and why she was in the health issues she was in. It turned out when we started working on her in class, she actually had to go outside and throw up, probably one of the first people ever. And that's when she revealed to us that she had been exposed to Chernobyl and basically we were pulling old radiation up and out of her without knowing it. Great. And um, what can we what can we look for you in the future, or what kind of projects you're going to be working on, or anything special? Or well, basically just moving um, more and more into Europe. Uh, there's so much interest over there. Um, really excited about that, and really solidifying our relationship with the medical field. And most of that will be via the institute and collecting our clinical data and publishing studies on what this really can do for people. Um, other than that, still pushing forward with the other two projects we mentioned, and hopefully um, finding a way not to live in airplanes as much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Anita. It's always a pleasure talking to you, and I love love your personality. I love your enthusiasm. It keeps me oh, going. <laughs> thank you. I yeah. love yakking with you too, and it's always fun to. You know, answer questions that people send in. I love hearing that there's interest. Yep. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you.